Good evening and welcome to uh, services here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak this evening while Hiram is away at a gospel meeting. I'm talking with Brittany this afternoon, she said that Hiram will be back tomorrow, so you have to suffer through a little bit more with me tonight. And I am suffering a little bit tonight, and I request your prayers. I'm dealing with a gout flare-up, and um, if I'm standing still, uh, I feel all right, but uh, I won't be walking around like, like Hiram does, otherwise I might fall over. The lesson that is drawn tonight is from the book of Malachi, and we'll try to say as much as we can in that book of Malachi. And Malachi is one of those books, if you're a preacher, it's not the most desirable book to preach from. Uh, but when we preach, we need to make sure that we uh, deliver the whole counsel of God. And so there are things that might be uneasy to talk about, or there might be things that are harder to talk about. They need to be in topics that are addressed. And tonight, the title of the lesson that you can see is guarding our uh, hearts and guarding our hearts from being and becoming hard-hearted. I want to take you back into the context of the book of Malachi. The time period is about a hundred years after the return from Babylonian exile. You have the people that came back with people like Ezra and Nehemiah, and those books tell of the restoration of the temple and the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. But although the people came back physically, in many ways there was not a return spiritually. And sometimes we need to see and examine how God's people can become so hard-hearted. Notice the opening verses of the book of Malachi that were read by Brother Kenny tonight. Uh, God says to the people through the prophet Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord. God loves his people. Undoubtedly so, he loves his people. And they need to know that he loves them. But he says, and the people say, yet, in, and they say, in what way have you loved me? Brethren, you need to understand that hard hearts start with forgetting God's love for you. And Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, explores how the people of Israel had become hard hearted and they had forgotten that God had loved them. Notice in those verses 2 through 6 I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And I have laid waste to his mountains, and his heritage is for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we, will, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be a territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord shall have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. One opponent of the Bible will look at this and he says, Well, I have a problem with God hating Esau. You know what's harder for me to wrap my brain around? In the same passage it says, I have loved Jacob. If you go and you study the, uh, the character of Jacob, Jacob, in a lot of ways, seems undeserving of the love in which God has poured out. He was a deceiver. He was the heel grabber. He uh, tricked different people. He also had his good qualities about him, and he showed his faith. And God, in understanding and providence, chose Jacob even before he and his brother were born. But when you go back and you look at that, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter 25 and Genesis chapter 28, Jacob receives the blessing. He receives the blessings from uh, the birthright of the firstborn that should have went to Esau. He also received the blessing that came from his father. God knew before that they were even born 
that he was going to choose Jacob over Esau. But Esau and his descendants had become Edom. And God is trying to tell the Israelites, I have loved you. And he could go through a, a long list of the track record of all the things that God has done to show his love for Israel. But even those people that came back from exile would have known about the country of Edom. The people of Edom were destroyed as predicted by the book of Obadiah. It was orchestrated by God. And even though Edom says, I'm going to return, I'm going to rebuild, God says, if you try to rebuild, I'm just going to tear it back down. Esau was hated. But Jacob was able to become back into their their country. And they were able to restore their city and their temple and their worship. God really did love Israel. And they should have, in return, loved him back for the love that he gave to them. But notice in verse number 6, he says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Israel's hearts had become hardened because of their loss and forgetfulness of understanding that God truly did love them. We need to learn the same lesson today. People that are backsliding, people that are struggling in their faith, it typically begins in the first place with, forgetting the things in which God has done for us, the ways in which God has loved us. There's a song that we sometimes sing. It's all, uh, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, uh, we need to count our blessings. We count our blessings. Because when we look back and we think about all the good that God has done in our lives, it helps keep that heart tender towards God who loved us. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. And then the second place we need to see this morning, we have hard hearts that come from forgetting that God has loved us, but it continues in tolerating mediocre and worthless worship. Notice in the following verses in Matthew 6, and this it, uh, continues all the way through Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 9. Notice what he says uh, in verse number 6, about halfway through. Him. Says the Lord of hosts to the priest who despise my name. And yet you say, in what way do we despise your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying that the, Lord, the table of the Lord is contemptible in this uh this direction of looking at the priests we don't have a um, physical priest today but each and every one of us are priests and also we need to think about those who are in leadership this is a direct question to those people who are in leadership turn to malachi chapter 2 and look at verses 1 through 3 with me he says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and a curse, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your face, the refuse from your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. When Israel had their solemn feast days, they would sacrifice those animals. And there were certain parts of those animals, of the entrails and the intestines, that they weren't going to sacrifice. They were to be discarded. And they took those out, and they put them in a place where they could burn them outside the camp. God is saying to those priests and those leaders, He says, the blessings that you give are worthless, I'm going to actually put a curse upon you, just like those entrails and the nasty parts. I'm going to throw you out in the same way in which you throw out those things for your solemn feast. There was a problem, and the problem started with the very top. 
And when the very top of the leadership, the priests are accepting things like defiled uh, offerings, it's going to make a whole lot of problems. Look in the continual verses. Look in verse number 5. This is the example that God gives from His servant Levi. Then you shall know that I have said this commandment, that, I, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and one of peace. And I gave him... I gave him that he might fear me, so he feared me, and he was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and he turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should keep knowledge, and people should keep or should seek the law from his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. This is the example of in which the leadership should be setting. People should be able to come to them for knowledge, for truth, for refreshing. But notice what those priests were now seeing in the eyes of the people. Verse number 8. You have departed from my ways. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people. Because you have not kept my ways, but you have shown partiality in the law. Again, like I said, this comes from the top. And if the top is messed up, it's going to have a trickle-down effect. You turn back into chapter 1, and you see in verse number 12. Notice in Malachi 1 and verse number 12, when they come and they offer, it says, you profane it. And he say that the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit is defiled. Its food is contemptible. You say, oh, what weariness. And you sneer at it. When we come and we worship our, our Lord, what's the thoughts? What's the feelings when you come to worship? Are you dragging in here and you say, Oh, we got to go through another service today. And does the song leader stand up and he leads the song and it doesn't sound like an upbeat march unto Zion. It sounds more like a death march. We need to be uh, cautious in the way in which we approach the Lord. Look in verse number 13 again. He says, you bring the stolen, you bring the lame, and you bring the sick. And thus you bring your offering. Should I accept that from your hand? And the, it is a rhetorical question, but it's absolutely not. And he says in the next vein of thought, he says, and look in verse, excuse me, in verse number, look back at verse number eight. He says, when you offer the, bl the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept it favorably? And all these questions, again, are rhetorical. We need to resound back with no. We need to make sure that we keep our worship fresh to God. We need to keep making sure that the sacrifice of our daily living is, remains fresh to the Lord. We cannot come and look at the things which we do and sneer at it. This is something that happens a lot of times, and sometimes I can be even guilty of it. When you're driving home from worship service, and maybe you're going out to lunch, or maybe you're going back home, and you start picking apart little parts of the service, and you say, well, I wish you would have done this a little bit better. I wish this would have been a little bit, and I wish the preacher would have. What are we doing? Are we not sneering at the offering? We need to watch ourselves and we need to guard against it. Israel physically came back into the land, but spiritually they were far from where they needed to be. We need to examine for ourselves just because we are physically here, are we spiritually where we need to be? We cannot bring the leftovers, the offerings, those things that are uh, abomination to God. 
The Israelites knew this. They needed to make sure that they brought the first, the very best. And so when we come to service and we worship our Lord, we need to be bringing our very best. And it's hard on the outside for you and I to maybe look at somebody else and judge whether or not their heart is really in it. But is it too hard for God to know where our hearts are at? Absolutely not. We may look like a heart that is vibrant and beating well, but inside we might be hearts that are made of stone. We need to fix those things. And then third way we need to see it tonight from the book of Malachi is hard hearts and hard-heartedness is perpetuated by corrupting the home and by corrupting God's institution of marriage. Notice in Malachi chapter 2 and starting in verse number 10. Have we not all one Father? And has not God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenants of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and abomination has committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings his offering to the Lord of hosts. If Satan can wreck a marriage, Satan can wreck a home. So many times when the institution of marriage is been done away with, we cause stumbling blocks to the children that grow up in those homes. And I don't want to be unaware of sometimes these things don't have to go this way. But the truth is and the reality is that when the home is messed up, it's going to affect the offering that we bring to God. One of the problems that Israel had before their captivity was idolatry. And how did they get into idolatry in the first place? They got into idolatry in the first place because of marrying foreign wives and foreign wives that had idolatrous practices. And so then kids are torn apart between the God of Israel and the God of Baal or any other name of uh, other gods. Israel and we need to make sure that we keep our homes in the right order. Notice in verse number 13, it says, And this second thing you do, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor does he receive with good will from your hands. And yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness, the witness between you and the wife of your youth, in whom you have dealt treacherously. We cannot think that we can have a, a home life and a marriage that is off the rails in one way, and then we come to worship, and then we, on the outside, even have tears in our worship. But those tears are vain. Is God happy with ritual? Vain ritual. Just by shedding of a tear and an outward appearance of something that looks pious or looks religious, he's not. Really, God can look through and see where your heart is at. The New Testament talks about the way in which we pray and our prayers, men, that will be messed up if our relationship with our wives are not what they should be. We need to make sure that our homes are taken care of in the right way. Notice further in verse number 15, he says, But did he not make them one? That is, that marriage having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed of your spirit, and, do not, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. God desires godly offspring. It's not just offspring that God desires, but godly offspring is what God requires. 
We are to, as parents, we have a responsibility to raise our children in the right way. And are we putting stepping stones coming to Christ? Or are we causing stumbling blocks because of the relationship that we have with one another? We need to take heed of uh, our own relationships and see how we are doing in those. When our home life, when our marriage is off, it's going to then affect the way in which we worship. Then in the fourth way we need to see tonight is how does one turn back the tide of hard-heartedness? That slide might be a little bit hard to read, so you might have to pay attention with me. How does one turn back the tide of hard-heartedness? And there are several different ways and avenues that we could look at this. Of how do we soften that heart that has been hardened? Malachi will offer a few that I want to look at here uh, as we close out our lesson. In the first place, we need to turn to God's message. The world will deliver all kinds of self-helps and different gurus that can help your marriage or help your worship life or help get your life on track. But God's word will always ultimately be the thing that brings us back to the right place. Malachi 2 and verse number 17. It says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, and yet you say, In what way have we wearied Him? And that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and He, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Oftentimes, people whose hearts who have grown cold to God's message, they'll point out parts of this world that have injustice. And they cry out, out really loud for this justice. Notice you can keep reading into chapter 3, verse number 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare a way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight. This is the guy you're looking for. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. Notice in verse number 2, though, the man who is crying for justice who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and as a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. I used to teach high school and middle school uh, and I sometimes I would give a test, and I would ask them as I passed out the test, when I grade them, do you want justice or do you want mercy? And I always tried to coach them, <laughs> kids to say, you want mercy. But we sit in this world, and we try to sit back, and we play armchair quarterback, we look at the injustices in the world, and we say, well, God, where are you at? Where is this God of justice? What happens when Jesus comes on the scene? And he is that refiner that's going to sift it out. Hold your finger in Matthew, or excuse me, Malachi chapter 2, and think about what John says in Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. John says, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire is talking about judgment that's coming. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The messenger preparing the way for the Lord is John the Baptist. And he's talking about the man who's coming behind him who will judge the world. And some who have been sealed with the Holy Spirit will be judged and they will be able to enter into their heavenly reward. But those who have judged without, they are going to be judged with fire and the punishment that is coming for them. We need to turn to God's message. 
God's messenger is, was Jesus. Again, we shout for that justice, but can we really stand in that day of judgment? What we ought to beg for is for mercy. In the second place, we need how to or how do we fix the hard heart? Malachi will then turn to our giving. Notice in Malachi 2 and verse number 7. From the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, in what way shall we return? Here's where God says, will a man rob God? Yet you say, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In your tithes and your offerings. Second way we can fix a hard heart is to put our money where our mouth is. Now some of you might start shaking your head and look away and say, the preacher's gone to meddle and begin. This is what Malachi is showing for how we can come back. We profess to be uh, Christians. We profess to be loyal to Christ. And what good works are we giving to? What good things can we put our time and effort and energy into? God says, put me first. A lot of times it's easiest to see on the outside, how we put God first in the things in which we give, in our tithes, in our offerings. Notice what uh, what God says in verse number 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me in this now, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be a room enough to receive it. Oftentimes, we go about in this life, we we proclaim one thing, but then we walk around with our cups so full, God has no room to bless us. We need to see and understand that the gifts that God has graciously given to us, it's a test for us to see where our heart is at. Will we keep those things to ourselves? Or are we willing to bless others? Abraham was one of the most richest men in all uh, of the Bible. But he was also a very gracious man with the money and the things in which he gave. He supported a whole lot of people. And he was immensely blessed because he was a blessing to others. When you turn in your the New Testament, you see the example that is given by those New Testament Christians. In Acts chapter 2 and verses 45, 44 and 45, it says, Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And then two chapters later in Acts 4 and verse 32 through 37, you see a similar vein. People had one heart and one soul. People came together and had all things in common. None of them lacked. People sold land and houses, and they brought them to the apostles' feet so they could be distributed to anyone who had need. An example that stands out is Barnabas. Son of encouragement is how he's called. This man is willing to give, give above and beyond the measure that is required. But because he had a heart that was soft, and because he had a heart that was tender, he saw a need, and he saw an avenue in which he could help in that situation. How we fix our hard hearts? We need to make sure that we fix our giving. The third place, how we fix our hard hearts, is remember how God has worked in the past. Look in Malachi 3 in verse number 14. Let's start in verse number 13. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is there that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness 
are raised up, and they even tempt God and go free. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the hard-heartedness had come to a point where it says, man, it's just useless to serve God. You know, they look out in the world, and people who are doing wrong seem to get away with it. And sometimes we can be tempted to do the same thing. But notice the remedy that comes in verse number 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened to the, and heard them. And so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. We need to remember what God has done for us. Again, sometimes on the surface we can uh, maybe put off a, a certain vibe that we have that tender heart. But God sees through into our hearts. And He sees the things maybe we only say in our hearts. But we need to continually remember. And when we remember God, God has a certain way of remembering us. Think about people like Noah. Noah, who was the last man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And all of the world that lived around him and yet God remembered Noah because Noah had remembered him. In Malachi 3 and verse 17, God says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. God sees and God knows who are his, and he will always be able to snatch them out of the fire. You remember the story in the book of Daniel, Daniel's friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It's one of my favorite Bible stories. And they were bound up and thrown into that fire. And who is there but one like the Son of God standing in the midst right there with them? God is with us when we remember to remember Him. And then the fourth way that Malachi gives us for how we can help fix that hard heart is to remember how God is going to work in the future. Notice in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all who do wickedly will be like stubble. Today in the Bible class, I asked Ian what it was like to go to Arizona and experience the heat out there. And he says when you open up the door to go outside, it's like opening up an oven and feeling the heat come into your face. This is what's compared to that day of the Lord that is coming. The proud will, will experience that burning like an oven. The wicked will be like stubble. And the day which is coming and which, they shall, uh, which shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and that will leave neither root nor branch completely cut off there is no coming back at this day of the Lord. Verse number two, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. You shall trample the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. We need to remember how God will work in the future. And there's two way, two ends on this day of the Lord. You're going to either be with the wicked and burned up, or you'll be with the righteous with God forever in heaven. Notice how 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9 says it. For they sh these shall be punished with an everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Those who have done wickedly and have been judged that way, they will be forever put into an everlasting destruction outside of the Lord's presence. But for those who are part of God's faithful, look verse number 2, it says they will experience healing. Verse number 2, it also says they're going to be fat and happy. 
In verse number two also, they will trample on the wicked. You need to remember what God will do in the future. The time in which God has permitted on this earth, many people will flaunt God's long-suffering and do wickedly and other things. But a day of reckoning is coming. So this morning, this evening, excuse me, we want to then extend the invitation. This is heaven's invitation. It is extended into those whose hearts have become hardened. Maybe you don't show it on the outside, but inwardly that heart is hard. And I ask you to turn back. God loves you so much. God loves you so much that He sent His own Son into the world to pay the ransom price for your sins. That way you can be reconciled back to God and be able to live with Him for eternity. We need to make sure that we give God our very best. And if we have been failing to do so, and again, maybe it's not something that is visible on the outside, but we know where our hearts are at. The invitation also stands for you to come forward and ask for prayers of strength and of healing to change back and make that heart tender again. There's a song that we sing uh, about hard hearts. It says, what can be done to an old heart like mine? And the answer is, soften it up with oil and wine. And the oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the light of your love. We need to uh, do that. The oil and the wine is Jesus and the sacrifice, the balm that he can offer. It's also extended for those who have never responded to the gospel call. In Malachi chapter 4, we notice that a judgment day is coming. And those who are wicked and they stand outside of God's grace will experience destruction and burning and ash. But those who are in Christ can have healing and life evermore. The invitation is extended. Please come as we stand and as we sing.